Go grab a seat. We're in for an interesting ride tonight. I want to welcome you uh, to the second to last of this year's of this year's open classroom sessions. Uh, and as you know, as you know, tonight we're going to be talking about the plight of the Metro newspaper. And in a few minutes, uh, uh, Professor Grogan, my colleague here, will introduce our speakers. Uh, for those of you who have never been to an open classroom before, can I see a, any hands of people who have not been here before? Wonderful to have you here. Um, as you know, this has been a, a semester-long class in which we've been looking at a whole series of urban issues. Uh, transportation, the role of public employee unions, housing, economic development, and we've had a wonderful array of guest speakers uh, on those topics. Tonight will be no exception, I can promise you. Uh, but before we begin, uh, I'm going to ask John Sarve, who has been, who is the executive director of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs, of which I'm the dean, and who has been responsible uh, for all the wonderful things that have happened in this class, uh, including all of the stuff you see. Here. Because earlier today, in preparation for this, John actually took a survey of you guys, those of you who have been in the class, about how we use the media. And I've asked John to give you the results of this instant survey. I think it's fair to say that this is by far not random. Uh, probably does not represent uh, most of the country or possibly even most of Boston. Uh, it sounds, when I look at the survey, that it represents people who live within about 150 yards of Harvard Square, but we'll, we'll see what this looks like in, in, in a minute. So John, if you just run through the survey results and then we'll get on with our program. Thank you, Barry. First of all, I want to say that we we're really pleased with the quick turnout. We only put the survey out at about 1 p.m. today. And, uh, let's see. We got 83 responses in just a few hours. So I'm just going to run through them. I, I won't get into too many of the detailed responses, but there were only seven questions. First question was, how often do you read the printed newspaper? About half of you, or exactly half of you, read it every day. Some read it weekly or less than weekly. Some read it sporadically. Uh, what, did, what did some of these people say? Oh, they gave you just gave more specifics on two to three or four to six. So. Okay, second question. And some of our guest speakers later this evening may uh, find may refer back to some of this data. Um, how many read the of the following daily newspapers, which do you read every day? 39% read the Boston Globe, 3%, two of you read the Herald, <laughs> some read the Metro, some read the New York Times, uh, no one reads the USA Today. Some don't read any paper every day. And some read the paper every day, but not in print form. Okay? The next question, I just wanted to get a sense for how many get the news online versus in print and, and just did, did three categories. One that those of you that get more of it in print than online, that's 35%. About 17% of you have an evenly split and 48% of you get more of your news online than in print. Next are some subscription questions. 35% uh, of you subscribe to the Boston Globe daily, 9% get it only on Sundays, and the online subscription I think is a trick question because I don't know if you can do that with all these papers just online. And then there are big percentages of uh, people that don't subscribe at all. Again, zero on USA Today. <laughs> Would you be willing to pay for a subscription to access news online? And this may bode well for the folks studying the business model of the Globe and other papers, 42% said yes. Um, number six, if the Boston Globe were to become a nonprofit organization like WBUR, would you be willing to support it with a contribution? Is 74% of you said yes. I'm going to click on this one just to see what amounts you'd be willing to contribute. 
<laughs> so here you get a sense for, a lot of you would probably give about $100 a year. Okay, going back. And then we, we probably can't get into, these are the open-ended responses to what would you suggest for the globe or other papers in general. Okay. Maybe we'll package this up and send it over to the globe. <laughs> a lot, there were a lot of comments about um, maintaining a priority on investigative journalism. Okay. So those are, those are the responses. Thank you once again for taking the time this afternoon to uh, respond to all 83 of you. One of the things that's been so exciting about this class, and again, thanks to John, is as you know, or many of you know, we have a, a blog that goes along with it. We've been getting wonderful online comments all along on all of these classes, and it has added so much to the value of this class. For those of you who have been tuning in uh, to the open classroom and giving your comments, we thank you. Uh, very much for those. I read them every week. I don't always respond to every one of them, but boy, I'm thrilled to think that we're using this technology in order to uh, get even more uh, content and uh, your, your questions and answers uh, about this course. Without further ado, uh, Paul Grogan uh, to introduce tonight's speak topic and speakers. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, I'm Paul Brogan. Uh, in real life, I'm the president of the Boston Foundation, as many of you know, and I'm not posing as a professor every uh, every Thursday evening. But it's my pleasure to introduce this very, very uh, important and provocative topic this evening, uh, and we titled this "The Plight of the Metro Newspaper," uh, with uh, with reason. And John Sarvi's uh, poll is a, as good an introduction. Uh, as any, because it is certainly no secret, I, I think, to anyone at this point that the, uh, the Metropolitan uh, Daily Newspaper, as we have come to know it, uh, is, uh, is an endangered uh, species. Um, the combination of this severe recession and longer-term negative trends, the shift to the web that uh, comes through so clearly in, in John's uh, uh, survey, survey and the failure to develop a, a business model that will support the kind of in-depth uh, reporting, including investigative reporting that uh, great metropolitan uh, daily newspapers do, has, uh, has landed uh, uh, newspapers uh, in, in extremis in many uh, cities and indeed some, uh, uh, some uh, venerable newspapers uh, have closed or are shadows of their former Selves. And we're well acquainted with this crisis here in Boston because of the uh, very visible travail of the Boston Globe this past year when the, uh, the uh, owner of the New York Times very publicly put the Globe uh, 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 in play in a number of ways by uh, shopping it for sale but simultaneously issuing a threat of closure unless uh, major uh, uh, concessions from the unions and other uh, employees and cost cutting uh, could occur and it was quite a drama that played out uh, for some months. As we know, the, uh, the Times uh, succeeded apparently in getting at least enough concessions to operate the paper without the hemorrhage of losses that it had been experiencing and announced uh, a short while ago its intention to keep the, keep the paper and keep it going uh, for the sort of foreseeable uh, future. But we don't want to just talk about uh, the plight of the paper. We want to talk about that in relationship to cities and healthy cities, uh, and vibrant cities uh, in particular. And uh, so we're going to hear from, uh, we hope, three speakers. Uh, Adrian Walker has been delayed apparently, but I'm confident he will uh, arrive, who I will introduce uh, uh, in a moment. Um, but as uh, the president of the Boston Foundation, someone who's deeply concerned about the civic realm, I just wanted to say that among the host of worries and uh, considerations about what weak newspapers might mean, weakened newspapers, or in fact the disappearance of newspapers. There, there are two things that, that spring immediately to mind, and John mentioned investigative uh, reporting. Uh, the, the Metropolitan Daily Newspaper plays a crucial role in holding uh, uh, all manner of institutions accountable, uh, investigating wrongdoing, but this is particularly important in, in the case of 
of government. And we have seen uh, during this year of travail that even in its weakened state, the Boston Globe uh, was very vigorously pursuing uh, scandal and wrongdoing and corruption in the public sector and getting some pretty dramatic results. Uh, the Globe, uh, perhaps not all by itself, but certainly was very material in driving one of the most powerful office holders, uh, the Speaker of the House uh, of Representatives here in Massachusetts from office. They exposed numerous scandals and abuses in, in the pension and health care uh, systems uh, uh, in the public sector, uh, provided relentless coverage of uh, the Boston firefighters and their refusal to agree to drug and alcohol testing and so forth uh, and so on. And perhaps more positively, the Globe played a major role in spurring a drive for education, sweeping education reform that is on the verge of enactment uh, at the State House. So we've had a kind of clinic uh, in, in this year as we watched uh, the pain and suffering and wondered what the outcome would be. It was a reminder, in a way, of why newspapers uh, uh, matter uh, in that sense. A second issue, uh, in addition to holding institutions, and in particularly the public sector, accountable, is the kind of civic glue that a great metropolitan newspaper uh, provides. Um, and uh, though the paper is in difficulty and younger readers are not reading papers uh, nearly so much, uh, it is still the case in Boston that with most of the leadership <coughs> positions in the public, private, and nonprofit sector are held by baby, baby boomers, or in some cases people who are somewhat older, it's almost literally true that those people read the Boston Globe every day. Uh, and it provides, a, of course, a vocabulary, a shared sense of what the issues and problems are, a kind of a civic glue that I think of as a tremendous asset uh, to a community. And uh, one wonders how that glue, how that same asset would materialize in the absence of a, uh, a, a single news source that is widely read, as opposed to many, many different news sources uh, that are not read in common. At all. So anyway, these are just two of, uh, of the many interesting and provocative issues we're going to explore this evening. And to help us do that, it pleases me to introduce our, our three speakers, uh, and they will uh, appear in order as I introduce them. First, we have Renee Loth, who is, uh, many of us have known as a longtime edit editorial page editor of the Boston Globe, a prize-winning journalist who uh, had been before her. Uh, retirement at the Boston Globe uh, for 15 years, an incredibly distinguished uh, career. Um, and she hasn't let it go entirely happily for many of us who are her fans because she writes a terrific uh, weekly column that appears every Friday in the Boston Globe, and she will uh, speak first. Second, uh, or perhaps third, if he doesn't arrive in time, will be Adrian Walker. Uh, who has uh, written a twice weekly column for the city and region section of the Boston Globe uh, since 1998. His column focuses on state and local politics and social issues. Before that, he was a city hall bureau chief, a state house reporter, and deputy political uh, editor. That's Adrian Walker. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we're going to hear from uh, Dan Oakland, who is uh, was recently named to the newly created position of public editor at the New York Times. The public editor works outside of the reporting and editing structure of the Times and receives and answers questions and comments from readers and the public. He's spent more than 25 years in magazine and book publishing. Among other things, he's been an editor at large at Time, Inc. Uh, he was the company's editor of new media. Uh, he was, he's been the managing editor of Life magazine, and so on and so on. So I think you'll agree that we have uh, three exceptionally uh, qualified people to uh, uh, stimulate us this evening with their own thoughts on the implications for cities of the plight of the metropolitan uh, daily newspaper. Let's start with Renee. Thanks very much. Um, Barry and Paul had asked me to outline for you um, my role at the Globe over the last 15 years as editor of the editorial page and um, some of the ways in which um, the Globe editorial page influenced public policy in Boston. Um, I'm going to do that. I'd also like to talk a little bit about what I think um, newspaper journalism provides. It's a particular public service that I don't believe can be replicated in the um, 
by the alternative media that we see flourishing today on the internet. Um, and you know, when it comes to alternative media, I have some bona fides, and uh, so it's not like I'm a big dinosaur in here. I, I, uh, um, they call us the mainstream media, or sometimes they call us the legacy media, which is really kind of a kind of scary phrase. But, um, I started in alternative journalism. I was a child of the 60s. I believed that um, newspapers provided a tool for um, fighting injustice and changing the world. I, I still feel that. Um, and I, I cut my teeth on a um, little uh, shoestring newspaper in East Boston, the East Boston Community News, which was an advocacy newspaper that fought uh, airport expansion and um, other urban uh, ills, but mostly from the airport. Uh, was almost like being a, a pamphleteer, like in the Tom Paine uh, variety. Um, after that, I worked at the Boston Phoenix for five years as an alternative uh, political reporter out of the State House mostly, but um, and the Phoenix, of course, was uh, um, not exactly mainstream. Um, and then, you know, I went to work for Dan Overett at the New England Monthly Magazine, um, where that was my first um, bout with legitimacy. Um, had all the hippie dust washed off of me. Uh, went to work for this nice, slick magazine, um, and uh, then the Boston Globe took another look at me when I, you know, got the hippie dust off and hired me um, to first be a magazine writer and then a number of different positions I've had at the Globe over the years, mostly around um, covering politics. Um, so, you know, I haven't always been a member of the dinosaur mainstream media. Uh, and I can cite many examples of what um, we on the editorial page sometimes joke about Globe gets action. Um, when, when something uh, that we've been advocating for a long time happens, we, we, that's kind of our little joke line around the office sometimes when we write an editorial about how gloomy the winter has been and the sun comes out, you know, Globe gets action. Um, so I can cite many of these, and, and I'm happy to do that. I will do that, especially um, as they relate to Boston. But I wanted to also talk about the accomplishments of some other newspapers um, first, um, especially because in some of the smaller communities in our, in our country, some of the smaller urban centers, I think it's, uh, newspapers are even more crucial than they are in Boston, um, uh, where corruption and, and uh, scandal can sort of um, breed um, without as much scrutiny as you sometimes get in a, in a big city. Um, you know, I'm actually more or less agnostic about the so-called platform for journalism, whether it's in an actual hard newspaper. I happen to like the feel of the newspaper, um, but I'm, I'm less concerned about that, about whether it's on a newspaper where people are reading us online. Um, but it is the, the, what I call newspaper journalism that I'm concerned about, the, the particular kind of journalism that traditional newspapers practice, um, which, um, you know, whether it's online or in paper, is, is really, um, you know, not immaterial. Um, but it is that newspaper journalism that I'm talking about. Um, so one example from the Charlotte Observer in Charlotte, North Carolina. Last year, um, reporters there unearthed horrific uh, patterns of worker abuse at a chicken processing plant there. Um, the paper conducted hundreds of interviews and dug through thousands of documents over many months to report um, about conditions um, in this processing plant where workers, many of whom were illegal immigrants and you know afraid of um, reporting uh, the conditions to anybody or, or complaining to anybody, these workers were being maimed by machines and poisoned by toxins, um, and the company wasn't reporting the injuries as they were required to do by law. Um, child labor laws were being uh, flouted with impunity, and um, anyone who complained was fired. Um, another example, okay, the Seattle Post Intelligencer. Um, their reporters um, took some real physical risks by infiltrating a, a new and dangerous gang um, in the city, um, you know, traditional kind of urban gang, and um, over a series of many months, um, wrote a series of, of stories that were remarkable because they trod a very delicate line between not glorifying the violence of these gang members, but also not denying the essential humanity of the individuals. It was a very delicate, very beautifully done um, series at the Seattle Post Intelligencer, and the paper won a big award for this um, 
just one month before the paper shut down. Um, and um, completely closed its print edition and slashed its online um, operation to 20 staffers. Um, they have the local mayor writing a column and they have, you know, prominent people in the community writing in and they've got a lot of citizen journalism, but there's only tw uh, 20 professional journalists still uh, operating on anything that looks like the Seattle Post Intelligencer. You know, at the Globe, um, I'm a it's something you don't know, but we are very proud to have won the Public Service Award from the Pulitzer Committee, the Pulitzer Prize for um, the investigation that the Globe Spotlight team did into the um, Catholic Church's cover-up of sexual abuse um, by priests. Um, this investigation took five full-time reporters on salary for a year. They didn't produce anything, not a single story, not a single inch of copy for one year, five reporters, um, many, many lawyers, um, lots of time, and um, a cost of approximately $1 million. Um, and so when the Globe editorial page um, called for changes in the, um, the statute of limitation laws so that uh, victims of abuse could have a longer time to bring charges against their abusers, um, or when we called for the resignation of Cardinal Law, um, we had behind us, you know, our voice was louder and more um, effective than just a single uh, victim would be, or a victim's group even, um, you know, because we had behind us the, the reputation and the history and the, um, the, the, the institutional power of this great community institution, the Boston Globe, which had for 135 years been building and slowly, you know, painstakingly developing uh, a reputation for probity and credibility and, and honesty. Um, so that when we speak, um, we have all of that institutional power behind us. Um, you know, uh, Paul Brogan mentioned some of the other things that the editorial page at the Globe has been uh, championing in, in the last several years. Um, the charter schools, we are, you know, fierce uh, supporters of education reform, often um, to the dismay of, you know, some of our friends in the labor movement. Um, we uh, pushed heavily for ethics reform, and I think we helped shape and um, succeeded in getting some of the most sweeping ethics reform legislation um, in a generation at the State House last year. Um, we were the first newspaper in the country to endorse President Obama, or then Barack Obama for president. Uh, which we're proud of. Um, we wrote a very strong editorial in favor of um, gay marriage seven months before the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court issued its ruling, so way ahead on that. And then a couple of years ago, we were even, we had like a little mini crusade um, to, um, <coughs> to better utilize the region's metropolitan beaches. Um, you know, the beaches from Dorchester to East Boston to Nahant to Lynn had all been kind of um, neglected and they were a great resource and um, something like a million people were, were lived within a subway ride of these beaches and yet they were kind of misused. We, every single Saturday for the entire summer, we went to a different beach and we talked about what, what uh, could be done there, you know, uh, different repairs that needed to be done, and we harassed the Department of Conservation and Recreation about it. And um, Governor Patrick, um, when he had his press conference, um, credited the Boston Globe editorial page with bringing this to his attention and appropriated $2 million to fix the metropolitan beaches. So, you know, Globe does get action from time to time. Um, this kind of journalism, the quality journalism that I'm talking about, the type that metropolitan newspapers practice, the type that, that requires verification, <coughs> practices the, ver the, the what we call the journalism of verification as opposed to the journalism of assertion, which you see a lot on the web. Um, the type that shines its light in every corner um, and just reports on what comes up as opposed to going into um, uh, the story with a predisposed notion of what the story is. Um, the type of journalism that demands attribution, that takes this kind of time, that dedicates staffs, that develops beats, this costs money. Okay, it, it's expensive to sue the Pentagon. <laughs> and that's what the New York Times did. They found that our government was, was eavesdropping on our own citizens. 
um, through a series of very um, complicated and expensive lawsuits and freedom of information requests, you know, some blogger in his pajamas is not going to get an answer from the Pentagon. Um, and this is an important reason why we need um, to keep these institutional um, newspapers, maybe they won't be on newsprint, but keep these institutional newspapers um, going. Um, you know, and yet, uh, you know, as you all know, newspapers are bleeding money. Um, the, the, the business model is broken, we're losing subscribers and, um, and advertising to the internet. The internet model doesn't really work in advertising. Um, it was nice to see that people would pay $100 um, for the newspaper or um, give a donation, but um, you know, that's really enough, not enough. If we were to tomorrow at the Boston Globe eliminate all of the presses, all of the trucks, all of the pressmen, all of the newsprint, all of that stuff that goes into the, into the uh, physical newspaper, we still wouldn't have enough revenue to support the journalism. The journalism is expensive. It's very labor intensive. It takes a lot of time and energy and digging. Um, and it's just not possible right now to um, support that just with the kind of resources that we can get from our online operations, even if you were to get rid of all the expenses that come with drivers and truckers and pressmen. Um, you know, there's a website out there, it's called Paper Cuts, and it um, tracks the crisis in American journalism. And they reported um, just this week that 60,000 reporters have lost their jobs since 2001. 15,000 of them this year alone. So there's a hemorrhaging going on um, in, in this uh, profession and uh, in this civic exercise. And the jobs that still exist, you know, now they require not just writing stories, but um, also, you know, reporters are expected to take photos and to do videography and to tweet and to blog and to respond to comments and to, you know, podcast and every other damn thing. And, um, you know, and it, all in a 27 news, you know, 24 7 news cycle, which makes it much harder to do the hard, slow work of developing sources and reading deeply into documents and, and building expertise on the beat, which is what traditional journalists do. Um, you know, this is not to say that there isn't a lot to like about, uh, about the internet and about the electronic media and how it's changed um, the way we absorb <coughs> information. Um, you know, the internet has absolutely democratized the news. That's a good thing. We're not being spoon-fed the news by three white guys on the networks every night anymore, and that's, that's very much a positive. But there's also so much, so much um, junk, uh, you know, unmediated junk on the internet. So much rumor and gossip and trivia, um, and I fear that they that this is driving out the quality information. Um, the shuttering of newsrooms, you know, is going to deprive citizens of the insights that only um, professionals uh, can deliver. They have the time, they have the skills, and they have the motivation to dig deeply um, into really difficult stories. A blogger, you know, with a slingshot um, will hit the occasional random target. Um, you know, and people who, uh, you know, defend um, the blogosphere, you know, have nice long list of examples, but it's difficult for them to take on entrenched institutions, as I said earlier. <clears throat> and I just fear that civic corruption will rise um, in the absence of professional journalism faster than any other, anything else can take its place, than the, the sort of hyper-local, wicked local sites, or citizen journalism, or anything else um, can, can take its place. Um, and then it's also a different culture um, and set of values on the internet, which um, are undeniable. Um, uh, you know, this idea that the internet is self-correcting.